Welcome to the spanking community. It's just like high school with more butt stuff. I mean, I don't know what your high school was like, but my high school did not have as much butt stuff. Okay, I'm not going to beat around the bush here. The Spanko scene has some drama. Drama is something that haunts every close-knit community. Over the last five weeks, I've been asking friends about infighting within their own communities, and after listening to their stories, I can guarantee religious groups, athletic fandoms, identity subcultures, they've all got drama. I mean, from what I hear, the knitting community has some giant clusterfuck of a crisis like once a month. Freud wrote about something he called the narcissism of small differences. In his words, quote, it is precisely communities with adjoining territories and related to each other in other ways as well, who are engaged in constant feuds and ridiculing each other. Think of, for example, the conflicts between Northern Irish Protestants and Northern Irish Catholics, or the Hoodoos and Tutsis in Rwanda, or, you know, even the Montagues and Capulets in Romeo and Juliet. Y'all know I think Freud is wrong about some things. But I think he was on to something with this one. And look, when you think about the ingredients we're putting in our pressure cooker, nudity, sexuality, consensual violence, uh, lifelong secrets, endorphins, drop, I mean, <laughs> come on, these are some potent materials. When you think about it that way, I'm frankly impressed that the Spanko community isn't more dramatic than it is. The truth is, I think we do a pretty damn good job of being relatively chill, considering the super high octane emotions we're dealing with here. But like all subcultures, the Spanko community does have its share of drama. And I want to talk about it because I know I'm responsible for inspiring some people to get involved in the public scene. And I think that is really, really great. Getting involved in the public fetish community truly is the best way to start making friends with like-minded people. But I do want young people or newcomers to the scene or people who are especially lonely or vulnerable to be aware of what sometimes happens. And I also want us as a community to try to get a handle on a little bit of this drama, because I know some of you are going to recognize the cycle I'm about to describe. And sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to identify it, give it a name, put it in writing. I've seen this cycle happen whew, at least four or five or six times now, and it's always exactly the same. Step one, the false intimacy of a shared fetish. I've mentioned the false intimacy of a shared fetish before, but it's a real thing and we really, really need to talk about it. Here's how it goes. Spanko friendships go from zero to a hundred in like a week. Most of us have felt like we've had this huge, terrifying secret bottled up for our entire lives. So when we meet people who share that secret and its associated insecurities, yeah, those friendships grow fast. But there is no recipe for instant intimacy. That first rush of friendship with other Spankos is as intoxicating as tequila, but like tequila, it's... You know, it's mostly empty calories. Real intimacy is built on a foundation of common values and interests, mutual respect, and above all, shared history. The false intimacy of a shared fetish is built on butt stuff. Now, to be clear, I am not dissing the butt stuff. I love the butt stuff so much that I ruined my own life to devote a trash pamphlet and a YouTube channel to the butt stuff. But just like a relationship can't survive on butt stuff alone, and I cannot stay alive on a steady diet of tequila alone, according to medical professionals. I mean, what do they know, right? Friendships that rest on the false intimacy of a shared fetish alone have expiration dates, which brings us to step two, the danger zone. Based on my extremely scientific evidence of like watching this happen a bunch of times, I think the false intimacy of a shared fetish lasts for about two years. 
three if you're lucky. But eventually, like any other drug, it starts to wear off. And that's the danger zone. Remember, these friendships feel really amazing at first, and they often land on people who have spent decades hiding a pretty major part of their identities from their real life friends and family. A lot of us come into the community with at least some degree of loneliness and isolation. Spanko friendships at first, you know, they feel like the end of all that. So when that initial rush of false intimacy starts to wear off, it's absolutely terrifying. People realize that they need to do something to get it back. And then something happens. It could be something really major like a breakup, or it could be something really minor like losing 10 pounds. It could be something I tweeted. It's definitely something I tweeted. Whatever it is, it's enough to set one person apart just a little bit. Which brings us to step three, the false intimacy of a shared enemy. As every borderline alcoholic with a hangover has discovered, the fastest way to make the bad feeling go bye-bye and get the good feeling back is more tequila. Likewise, the best way to recapture the quick fix of false intimacy is with more false intimacy. But you've already used up the false intimacy of a shared fetish. It's run its course. What's next? The second time around, it's the false intimacy of a shared enemy. That one person who has been set apart in some small way becomes extremely useful to everyone else because talking about one person with other friends reinforces those friendships. It makes those friendships feel close, intimate, even a little bit conspiratorial, a lot like they did back at the beginning. I want to take a second here to throw out some disclaimers because I really, really don't want this video about Spanko drama to cause spanko drama. <laughs> First, let's make this super clear. I am not excusing myself from this one. I've been complicit in all of this shit from both sides. I've been one of those friends who unknowingly uses the false intimacy of a shared enemy to reinforce friendships. And I've also experienced the early stages of being the person who got set aside in the interest of reinforcing other friendships and the early stages of that were sad enough that I had no interest in sticking around for Act 5. So I left at intermission. Because I have seen this cycle so many times and experienced it from a variety of perspectives, I have genuine sympathy for everyone involved. I don't think there are bad people here. To quote my favorite new fetish philosopher, <laughs> Spankos are people too, uh, and like there are good people uh, and bad people, there are lots of wonderful Spankos and I'm sure um, some, some pretty average ones as well. <laughs> this cycle is just a bunch of great to average people making choices that I can totally understand. Closing ranks with some friends to isolate a shared enemy doesn't feel mean or catty when it's happening. It feels like loyalty, friendship, or in some cases, even like a moral stand if they've managed to frame whatever set the one person apart as a moral dispute. And that's it. That's the drama. One person gets ousted and the remaining friendships party on at the wake for a few more years. At which point, of course, the cycle starts again. So what's the solution? How can we unsubscribe from this spiral of false intimacy and build real intimacy with each other instead? The short answer is, it's hard. I do believe that real intimacy demands at least some periods of physical proximity. I don't believe real intimacy can grow entirely on our phones. But that's like a really big problem for us because our phones and the internet they connect us to are the only way most spanking fetishists will ever find and talk to each other. I mean, I'm talking to you through the internet right now. The luckiest ones live in cities with active Spanko communities, but everyone else only gets to see our fetish friends in person at parties a few times a year. Without our phones, we've got nothing. So the truth is, I don't have great answers here. But I'll tell you what's working for me. 
or, you know, what seems to be working for me. For now. Here's hoping. First, just be aware of this cycle and keep an eye out for it. If you find yourself falling head over heels in platonic love with a new Spanko friend, that's awesome. But look for additional ways to build that friendship on platforms other than spanking or a shared enemy. If you're in the same city, that's much easier, but you can also do it through phones. Read the same book and discuss it. Argue about politics. If you've got a fashionable friend, send a picture and ask for his advice before you buy a new outfit. If you've got a friend who loves football, ask for predictions on the upcoming game. I'm not saying don't do the butt stuff. Definitely, definitely do the butt stuff. Just be active and intentional about fertilizing those friendships with vanilla interests too. Second, and I know I say this in like a third of my videos, but please consider outing yourself to just one or two trusted friends who aren't in the fetish world. I understand why that's absolutely not an option for some of you. I get emails from people all over the world, and I do understand that in some countries, this kind of disclosure is just not possible. But most of you are watching me from the US and the UK, and I really hope that most of you already have the kind of friend who you can share this secret with because I really do think that helps. It takes some of the pressure off your Spanko friendships if they're not the only people in the entire world that you can talk about this stuff with. And when the stakes don't feel as high, it's easier to relax and just let real intimacy grow the only way it can, slowly. Finally, and most importantly, and I really can't stress this enough, so I hope you're taking notes, don't tweet. Never tweet.